to you about what happens after the program and what do companies, what are companies looking at uh, at the other end once you complete. Uh, and uh, we are very fortunate because of the unique design of this program uh, that uh, we have uh, our peers ourselves uh, along with us to share about what is it on the other side of the tunnel as uh, as uh, several of us would imagine uh, before i hand over the session to them uh, a humble request to all of you uh, we, we will share this image and you uh, so you saw an image that we had uh, published uh, shared with all of you in this uh, in the screen right now right can you put this as your whatsapp status or let's say instagram handles where you talk of this particular session. And I'll also share the uh, website. Uh, uh, support team, can you share the events website uh, in the chat? The images will be there in the uh, events website. Uh, can you use that as your WhatsApp handles in the next, uh, in, along with the WhatsApp status or uh, Instagram images, wherever you can, so that uh, the uh, I mean, other people become aware of the uh, BSc degree program that has been uh, offered by IIT Madras. Uh, the primary reason is the qualifier uh, form for June uh, has opened. Uh, we are seeing very less, uh, I mean, it has been opened just uh, uh, a month back, but we are seeing only very less entries. Uh, we hope that through this, your own social circles, you being micro influencers, uh, so to say, that's the new buzzword around. Uh, we hope to see more people coming over to the BSc degree program site and uh, seeing what is offered and how these will be used. Uh, yeah, so our uh, support team has just shared uh, the uh, website where we are uh, putting up all the cultural or the student driven events. Okay. And uh, uh, on Friday, we are we are anxiously looking forward to the cultural event that's happening on uh, uh, Friday. Uh, we will have it's a closed door event. Unfortunately, we can't open it for everyone. It's a closed door event, so it's all for BSc degree uh, students by BSc degree students. So we are having a lot of people have submitted uh, their uh, uh, cultural uh, performances. So we are looking forward to it. So this is the first non-academic event that we are having in this uh, it's all of the uh, students by BSCDP students. So we are having uh, somebody has uh, submitted uh, their uh, cultural uh, performances. So we are looking forward to it. Yeah, please. Uh, so a humble request to all of you. Uh, uh, please mute uh, your mic. I understand that uh, when you are joining in through mobile, the mic, uh, mic will not be muted. Uh, so please make sure that uh, your uh, mics are muted. Uh, so without much ado, uh, let me now go to the primary. Uh, I mean, so the spotlight is not on us today. The spotlight is on three of your peers. So uh, let me give you a, a, a very short uh, a brief introduction to the three uh, speakers today. Uh, Rahul, uh, Devasmith, uh, and Shantanu. They are working professionals. So uh, they had shared about uh, their details to me, and I was like, oh, struck I mean, come on. <laughs> With this much experience, why are you on the other side of the program? Uh, rather, uh, you should be in the employment, you should be taking students from us. And everything. So it's amazing that they have come back to learn. So let me just give you a brief introduction to uh, the three of them. Uh, first, I will go with. Uh, shall I use alphabetical order? So I think it will be D. Uh, R S, as in uh, decision review system of uh, in cricket. Okay. So first is uh, Deva Smith Mohanty. Uh, he has almost 20, 22 years of work ex. Currently, he is uh, he is uh, he is a entrepreneur, and he uh, has uh, his company's name is Tratlytics. 
I hope I got it right, Devasmith. Yeah, okay. that's right. Strategy plus analytics. Strategy. Yes. Yeah, Stratlytics. And he's based uh, in Bhubaneswar. Okay. Uh, the next person whom I would want to introduce is our Rahul Chakravarti. He's a senior talent acquisition specialist uh, uh, at Synergy Compliance Solutions. Uh, I hope uh, I got the uh, company correct, right? So Synergy okay. Compliance Solutions, Rahul. Yes, Rahul, we are not able to hear you. Hello, Rahul. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That was right. Yeah. And uh, finally, we have Shantanu Ghosh, uh, who is uh, analytics and data architect uh, with uh, in SAP technology stack at IBM India. Now, this is a name at least I am familiar with. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So nothing, uh, nothing against both of you, but this is the only name that I have got. So, uh, uh, so how this session would be is each of these speakers will uh, have. So we have given a small template to them. And uh, they have uh, prepared their uh, 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 session, so to say, uh, uh, on that along that template. Uh, so each speaker will be speaking about them. Uh, their uh, they will be explaining our data science case study and how data uh, the subjects that you are learning how it is relevant with respect to uh, the actual data science scenarios that they face uh, in uh, production. And they will also talk a little about managing multiple roles, okay? Uh, this is one of the bigger tasks uh, that every degree student uh, will be uh, encountering as the terms progress. So, uh, so uh, is the same order fine with you? Uh, first, Devasmith, then Rahul, then uh, Shantanu, is that fine with you? Absolutely, okay. that's fine. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so here goes uh, the first speaker for the day, uh, Deber Smith Mohanty. Uh, the floor is uh, open to you. Sure. All right, so let me share my uh, screen. Hopefully, everybody can see my screen. Uh, Deber Smith, just hold on. It is uh, it is getting uh, shared. I think there is some network delay. Okay. Uh, can you try sharing again, David Smith? I'm not able to see. Okay. It. Let me let me do that. Maybe now? you can maybe you can try to switch off your video because that kind of eats to the band it's you know, the bandwidth a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, the best Maybe you can uh, switch off while the presentation is on. Okay, all right. Let me do that. Stop video. Okay. Yeah, can you now uh, reshare the content once more? I hope sure. uh, it will be visible. Sure. Hold on, guys. Do not worry. Uh, we have time till 7.30. All these people are here to uh, answer your questions. Uh, talk about what is it. Yeah, and we also have a backup. All of them have shared their slides with us. So worst case, we will share the slide for you. And we will uh, uh, let them talk. Okay, so I shared my screen again. Hopefully, it's visible this time. Mm, no, uh, no, Devasmith. Uh, what I'll do is, uh, Devasmith, I'll just use the latest uh, presentation that you have sent us, and yes. uh, uh, I'll, I'll share my screen instead. So you can tell me sure. when to move the slides. Sure, absolutely. Let's do that. I think yeah. that will be better. Okay, so it's like Murphy's law, right? Yeah, what they call it when things are not supposed to go wrong, they go wrong. 
So I hope uh, the slides are visible for everyone. Yes, it is. Okay, fine. So, uh, okay. Smith, you can tell me uh, when to move. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, so I think everybody knows uh, that we are all students here. So uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, so uh, Sir has already talked about me. So I I become an entrepreneur about little less than a uh, little more than four years ago. Uh, before that, I spent about uh, 17 to 18 years in the corporate world, uh, primarily in the banking sector, HSBC and Citibank. These are the two banks I worked. Uh, and then also I did work in Africa for some time with TransUnion. And uh, in India, I worked one job uh, with TransUnion Sybil. So many of you may go and apply for loans with uh, banks like ICC Bank or HDC Bank. So they actually use something called a credit score. So I was uh, part of that development team, I led the effort. So if you are interested in uh, about credit scoring, we can uh, connect uh, offline about that. Okay, so let's, and I have a background in statistics. Um, so obviously I've been fascinated with numbers and uh, application of uh, uh, analytics, particularly in the financial world is very heavy. So I come from that background, but of course, you know, uh, uh, this program is exciting. So let's go to the next uh, slide, sir. Um, so you may wonder, like, you know, why are you doing a BSc degree after after a master's, right? So I think, you know, uh, the more and more you work, you realize that the fundamentals are very important, right? So I'm here in this degree to learn the fundamentals of data science. I have already seen many courses uh, in Coursera or any other platform. But this is really a, a program when I looked at the content, it really was very exciting and, and it, I resonated with, uh, it, it resonated with me that I need to go back and learn the fundamentals of math or stats the way it should be taught. Uh, secondly, uh, I came from engineering background. Programming is not a uh, strength. So I wanted to learn and improve my programming skills, particularly in Python. And of course, third, at least uh, last but not the least, you know, I think IIT Madras is one of the best uh, technical institute in India. So obviously I want to learn from the best. And of course, the students that are part of this program, I consider them as one of the best lot. Uh, in the country, so I also uh, need to learn from them uh, while interacting uh, as part of this program. Okay, awesome. So let's move on to the next one. So what uh, the template was to, you know, we are working on as a working professional, we are working on many, many uh, data science problems. So particularly, I wanted to focus on one case study uh, where basically, you know, it is, it is uh, going to be important uh, for us. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to deep dive on this particular case study. Uh, yeah. So before we start, just a brief background. Uh, this company that I'm part of, uh, our center is in Bhuvaneshwar, but we have got a sales office in UK and US. So we primarily work on overseas projects uh, centered around three verticals, or uh, what you may call as domains. So I came from financial services background. We have got uh, associates who come with retail and uh, energy background. So we do a lot of consulting work in these uh, three verticals. So for today's discussion, uh, if you look at the last column energy, there is something called demand forecasting, right? So I'll talk about, you know, what it is uh, in my next slide, right? Uh, so how we use data science uh, to solve that problem. So let me set the context by stating the business problem, right? So this is a client of ours. Uh, which is basically an oil and gas giant. And this client is actually what you call as an integrated energy company. That means they do oil exploration, they do uh, basically all kind of refining and then finally do the marketing, right? So the so entire end to end. So for them, uh, obviously there are multiple divisions. We are working with their lubricant division, uh, which basically manufactures lubricants for their automobiles, motorbikes, uh, industrial machines, even including ships, right? I'm sure all of you who go and change your oil for the car or your motorbikes, you know, you use those products. These are all everyday use products. Because they are a large giant, they have a lot of products. You In a retail world, it's called a stock keeping unit, right? So when you go and buy something, the software actually scans the barcode. So think of that as a unique identifier to identify a product. So they have close to 5,000 uh, stock keeping units. And for each one of them, they need to know every week what's going to be the demand uh, so that way they can manufacture them, right? So that is their main business problem, right? And, and they need to take that as an input to uh, decide how much of raw material they want to buy or how they want to do their production plan, right? 
the challenge was uh, that they are using a system where it is producing some kind of forecast and the accuracy is not good. That means whatever they predict, it's not coming very close to the uh, actuals, right? So, so that is why they are suffering, where if you over predict, then you will end up with a lot of stock, what is called overstocking. If you under predict, then you will not manufacture and then finally customs will come to your shop and, and not be able to buy, right? What is called st uh, stock outs, right? So either of the situation, uh, if you overstock, there's an inventory carrying cost. If you if you understock, then there is what you call as you lost revenue opportunity, right? So, so I think the forecasting solution, obviously nothing is going to be 100% accurate, but you want to stay within a very close band, a narrow band of the actual number. I, I think that's the goal, right? So they were looking for a solution uh, um, to, to improve those results. And we basically decided to use machine learning algorithms to improve the forecast accuracy. And we ended up building about 5,000 plus machine learning models and uh, we did use uh, Microsoft Azure ML Studio, uh, one, the, one of the cloud platforms, right? So the result was we were able to improve their forecast accuracy for the entire pool uh, for about 12%. Uh, we started with one plant and they have like four plants in Europe. Uh, we were able to reduce the city stock. Uh, basically, these are all what you call as like buffer stock. In case there is a demand, um, then they use that um, by four, $4 million. So that's a huge impact to the bottom line. And because of the initial success in one of their German plans, now they're going to roll it out to, to the rest of the Europe in the next uh, three months, right? From a tool perspective, we actually did use Python and of course, uh, structured query language to get the data from the databases. And uh, Microsoft Azure was basically the platform, right? Okay, let's uh, go to the next slide uh, to talk a little bit more uh, details. Next slide, please. Yeah, so now I'll kind of go into, now that I've talked about the summary, I'll go into the details. So we started the data collection. So the data was stored in one of the ERP platforms and there was a lot of relational databases where all the historical order history was stored. So we, write, we wrote SQL programs to extract those month by month, uh, sorry, week by week details for each of those uh, stock giving unit to be talked about for a two year period, right? Because you know, to build a model, first we need a history, right? Uh, and then, and this is where the domain knowledge becomes important, right? So you have to ask yourself the question, what basically drives the sales of uh, lubricants, right? What could be the possible demand uh, drivers, right? So we thought that, you know, economy, like if the economy is booming, uh, you have more cars being produced, more people are buying cars, or more industry is growing, so industrial machines, more shipping, right? So those are some of the fundamental drivers that drive the usage of lubricant, right? So we ended up augmenting our data by getting a lot of uh, external macro indicators for about 70 odd countries these uh, folks operate, right? So once we got all the data collection, then we had to do a lot of data processing. For that, we selected, um, uh, you know, like we did everything in Python and we processed all the, uh, and then we had to get rid of a lot of data that we did not need, like there are a lot of irrelevant information that is not important for, for the model building. And then, uh, the, the, there are specific nuisances, like some people actually, uh, you know, return the, the sales, we had to uh, negate that and all that. Then we also found out that not all products are uh, same, so we had to segment them into homogeneous groups. I'll talk about that, how it actually helped. Then once we got the data into order, then we got into the mechanics of modeling. I will talk about that. So we use statistical models as well as machine learning models. Then once the models are built, then we actually had to put into production what we call as deployment, right? So we had to build a data pipeline, and then basically on a month by uh, on week by week basis, uh, we're doing the forecasting. And then at the end of the month, we would actually compare the actual results with the forecast, and we'll calculate the forecast accuracy at, at, at each stock level, and then basically push the results back into a reporting dashboard. In this case, uh, the company in question was using uh, Microsoft Power BI. That's actually a nice data visualization tool where it is very easy for the end users to go and consume the information that comes out of the model, right? So they can slice and dice um, how each forecast uh, is performing, vis-a-vis um, -vis geography by channel, by brand, and all that kind of information, right? Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so now it'll come out of the approach. So it's very important to pick the right tool, right? We know that we are using time series models. Statistical methods are very well documented. Uh, you may have heard about ARIMA, uh, Auto Regressive uh, Integrated Moving Average. So those are very, very popular. So we wanted to use that to baseline the results first. So even ARIMA, there are like two variants, like you can use a single variable versus multivariable. I think 
in future statistics courses, we may cover that. Then in the second branch is where there are machine learning methods. There are so many methods that are available. We just pick two, but of course there are other methods also we did try. But for today's illustration, I wanted to emphasize on a method popularized by Facebook called Profit. That's very relevant for time series. And of course, LSTM is very popular, and I'm sure many of you have already done programming uh, on LSTM. So our job was to kind of also inform the client about pros and cons of each method, because obviously, you know, uh, as, as consultants, we are not married to any particular method. We are here trying to solve a problem, right? So there are many ways to skin the cat. We wanted to really, you know, see which method is more appropriate for uh, for this particular client. So that, and of course, traditional method, it's much simpler and easier to explain, whereas a more complex method like machine learning will capture more nonlinear trends. But of course, it's very difficult to interpret. I mean, of course, there are there are a few things like K-line and all that, which can explain what variables is, uh, is driving our decision. But nevertheless, you know, we, we wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, um, by increasing model complexity, how much increased accuracy we are getting, and then is it worth it by making things uh, more complex? All right. Okay. Next slide, please. All right. So what we did is, you know, think of like you know each SKU when you look at the the historical pattern, right? We kind of put them into two by two quadrant, right? Because it was important to understand that we cannot uh, do one size fit all strategy, right? So if you look at the bottom two, you can see that uh, if you consider uh, X axis is my time and Y axis is my cells. So in that case, uh, you can see that the bottom quadrant, it's populated every, the frequency is populated every time period, right? That's one. But when we look at the X axis, you see there are some gaps, right? So the product is not sold every week. So there are some gaps. So essentially uh, there is an average time interval, right? So if we use these two metrics, right? I'm looking at the variability with respect to the timing and variability with respect to the quantity. So think of if many of you are doing electronics, if it is a, like a digital signal, right? I'm looking at both the amplitude as well as the frequency, right? So you can look at that aspect and I want to put them into like, you know, four quadrants. So low, high, low, high, this combination. Then what happens is it creates a framework, different algorithms work very well uh, in different quadrants, right? And that is exactly how we solve the problem in a very, very fundamental manner, okay? All right, so we to because it's difficult to explain these concepts to the business users. We started naming them, right? So we said, okay, this lower bottom up corner is called smooth because it's you can see that it's populated very nicely and the variance is very low. So it's really smooth, right? Think like a smooth jazz, right? Then the other other part to the right is like erratic, right? So even if it is frequency is populated, but but it's really volatile is very high, right? So that's how it is, right? And the lumpy and intermittent. I mean, intermittent is a pretty, you know, well-known English word and lumpy also is very well documented, right? All right, so the idea of naming this quadrant is to relate to the business user so they can actually understand what it means instead of calling low, high, low, low, you know, it creates confusion in the minds of people. So, okay, all right, so now let's go to the next slide. So then what we did is we built all the models. Uh, there was one, the one, one minor uh, question because there was a chat comment uh, uh, which said, uh, so there are some first year users who are not familiar with the business domain. So uh, one minor clarification that I will ask you is basically uh, based on the slide, uh, I mean, based on the various data that you obtained from cleaning, processing and everything, you classified the storage keeping uh, units into these four categories, right? That's, yes, that's right. That's, that's right. What, yeah, and then you can pick different algorithm for different quadrants. So the idea is to make the uh, complex problem much simpler. So you can have a category of algorithm work on one segment versus not. So that was our idea of simplifying the complex problem into simple. So you can focus on different kind of algorithms. So on, on basically those. out of the different storage units based on which category the, uh, the storage unit uh, came in, you will have a different algorithm predict uh, the storage values for that uh, unit. And this That's essentially cool. helped you in solving the larger problem, how much stock to keep in each one, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, thanks. So, thanks. When, when we go to the next slide, I think the results will be a little bit clearer. So yeah. uh, what we did is we did the forecast for each uh, stock keeping unit. We compared actual versus forecast, and you see two bars, right? So the blue ones is what the client was using today, right? Before we came with the picture, right? And with the new machine learning methods, you see the the green bars, right? So blue bar is our kind of benchmark, 
and think of like average accuracy for for these stocks and roughly each of them are like 25 percent of the business right so if a business is let's say thousand dollar of sales then roughly we have like four equal groupings then you can see that out of the four segments we are able to improve results in three so all i want to say is machine learning cannot solve all problems right there's still a lot of like for example this erratic that i talked about one of the quadrants we still have a lot of work to do on that this is still you know uh, it's a journey we started this about three months back and it's still going to go another three to six months but at least we saw some promising results right by using these machine learning methods we can actually improve over typical uh, statistical methods that uh, folks use right so and it, it one, 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 one question so these uh, four storage keeping units store the same set of uh, the same kind of thing right uh, oil and gas the same yeah, kind I mean, of uh, resource yeah so uh, think about they have like 5000 products right so uh, each of uh, each of them have about 1000 odd uh, uh, like uh, skus right so i'm Taking 4,000 uh, products, group one, 1,000 products in one group, next 1,000 in another group, based on their similarity, based on the patterns, how they're sold. Okay. Not really a, yeah, that's, so it's almost like a clustering uh, algorithm, right? Okay. Based on sales. Yeah. Okay. So, so for all I'm the people saying, who are, yeah, who didn't understand this part of the conversation, it is basically, you. Uh, he has a lot of, lot of items uh, which he has appropriately pro, uh, put into, uh, labeled it as, four different categories just right. think of it like that yeah correct so i think if i can explain like if, if i got a lot of products like oranges bananas and apples right and to keep all the apples together all the bananas together and all the oranges together right and you to do that i have to look at the shape maybe it's a squarish versus so like a longish right so first i'll separate bananas to the left hand side and then maybe oranges and apple to the right hand side next i'll start looking at the color or the texture right so, so that is how you know some of these segmentation things work i know we'll cover that in probably stats too uh, but some some of those applications so it's actually important why stats and math is important in this uh, course and how it is actually used in real life uh, uh, problem solving right okay so the the summary is we are able to at least address 70 percent of the problem if not all right that's that's the bottom line okay all right let's go to the next one uh, yeah that, that's all okay so this actually is a good good segue like you know in order to really uh, be good at the problem solving what are the critical skills that are necessary right so i call it data science knowledge is very important because we live in the world of data in order to solve this problem you need to be familiar with all kind of algorithms right there are many many algorithms and i think you know uh, we must understand each of these algorithms thoroughly particularly you know how the ct courses are covered right the logic and you know how how the cluster happens what are the different pseudo codes right by knowing that you will actually understand for to solve a particular problem what kind of algorithms you need it's not like throwing you know everything at at one problem but rather be very knowledgeable about that because it also costs time and energy to solve the problem each algorithm takes time right secondly domain knowledge uh, it's very important to know the industry you are in um, because then you can create the right design and framework. And secondly, when you are doing something called a feature engineering, you'll take the raw data, you'll massage the data, summarize and aggregate. That's called feature engineering. It will be covered in ML course. So domain knowledge becomes very critical to, to be good at that. Of course, programming knowledge, I don't need to tell, you know, to uh, manipulate the data, manage the uh, data pipelines and all that. You need to be very, very strong in your programming skills. So particularly Python is gaining a lot of ground, but in real life, Python, R and SAS, these are the three leading tools uh, that are used in data science applications. And last but not the least, I think this is probably the most underspoken is the communication skills. You may be the brilliant data scientist. But ultimately, most of the people you talk to in the business world, they do not understand anything about data science or algorithms, right? So in that case, when you're presenting the data science results, you have to talk about uh, the numbers, like how it impacts their world and it solves their business problem, right? Even in this slide, I didn't talk about algorithm, right? Uh, we can always have a debate about that. It's more about are you solving the business problem? If you do and you are able to communicate the complicated stuff in a very simple English-like manner, then you'll be able to connect with your business users, right? Uh, I think, you know, uh, so that is how, what is very, very important, okay? All right, uh, next one, please. And then uh, coming to the practical challenges of, uh, you know, being a working professional, you take on multiple roles. So how do we manage uh, those different roles? Uh, 
particularly for working professionals. So let's go to the next slide. So for me, this is my last slide. So for example, you know, uh, everybody gets 24 hours a day and, and when you have a full time job, I do have a family. I've got two kids also, right? So time import, time management becomes very important, right? And this BSc degree is also pretty demanding, right? So I think we are told that it takes about 10 to 15 hours on an average per course, right? Um, uh, so it is important to do very, very um, uh, wisely how you spend time, right? So I actually have a to-do list every day. Uh, I spend weekdays for my work, maybe one or two hours per day on this course. Weekend is where I spend most of my time. And now everybody has to create their own schedule, but I do uh, stick to my schedule and on a daily basis. Second is about social media usage. You know, it, while it is very good, uh, but but it has also become a distraction of late, right? So I basically got rid of uh, all my social media accounts. I mean, I don't use it anymore. Uh, I, it saves me about an hour per day. Um, and then third is cell phone usage, right? So phone, um, something I keep it away while working and studying, right? So, so I think those are very simple things. It's you know, it's simple yet difficult to implement. If you try it. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, I'm a data driven guy. Uh, uh, we, I saved about one hour, 15 minutes on an average every day uh, after I implemented that. And that one hour I can now spend uh, on things, uh, you know, uh, uh, on things that is more important to me. Right? So I, I think I will kind of end it here. This is exactly what I want to talk about. And I wanted to thank IIT Madras and JKSR for giving this opportunity to share my experience with all of you. And hopefully we'll interact in future and learn from your uh, experience as well. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you, Deva Smith. Uh, so we will hold. So uh, a general announcement to all learners. All these sessions, the slides, uh, the speakers have uh, permitted us to share it with everyone. So we will be uploading it in the same Google site that we have uh, uh, up, uh, already shared with you in chat. So Deva Smith, you can actually look at the emojis that are coming in uh, the WebEx right now. So uh, I mean, think of it as a standing ovation for the. Uh, session that you just did. We'll come back to you because I think rather than data science question, there are a lot of uh, non-academic questions like how do you manage time? How do you <laughs> study? What is your schedule? I think we will come to that part uh, as part of our Q&A. Uh, we'll be giving uh, opportunities for people to uh, raise their questions and uh, uh, speak to each speaker. Once again, thank you, Deva Smith. Uh, so you. I'll, I'll just... Uh, Stop sharing. Yeah, and yeah. After Deva Smith, we have uh, Rahul. Uh, Rahul, can, uh, can you just check whether you are able to share your slides uh, uh, through the WebEx session? I understand that you are using a mobile. You want us to uh, share I the slides? Using, I'm kind of using both mobile for the audio and uh, uh, the laptop for sharing yeah sure so can you try sharing uh Deva Smith, if it is not uh, too much time consuming uh you can answer the chat from your uh uh, uh your uh account Definitely, sir. And again, uh, the entire session for all those people, uh, if you have friends who missed out this session, please do tell them that there is a YouTube stream of the same session happening. So if you missed out also, do not worry. If there was a power cut, do not worry. The entire session is there in YouTube. But yeah, for all those people who are planning to attend the cultural session, it will not be streamed live in YouTube. It is a closed door event. You have to come to the WebEx session to enjoy the, uh, uh, the social, uh, the performance of your peers. Okay. Yeah, Rahul, uh, are you able to share? Let me just check. I think I did. Can you see me? Uh, Rahul, I, mean, can I you, think uh, it is slightly screen? slow. I think it is slightly low. Is it? Yeah, it is not coming for us. Uh, this is the same one which you have shared uh, with me earlier, right? Yeah, the same one in the afternoon. The one that I. Okay, so let, why don't I? Uh, I'll I'll share it from my side. No, no worries. Yeah, I'll just stop my video so that my bandwidth is. Served 
And what I'll do is uh, just hold on a minute, uh, Rahul. I'm just downloading sure. and uh, downloading that uh, PPT in my machine. Uh, meanwhile, you can talk a little bit about yourself so that uh, I'll reach that slide by that time. All right. So, uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Rahul, Rahul Dr. Wotu, and I'm from Kolkata. I've been working over the past three and a half years on the talent acquisition and been working in uh, both the North American and the European market as well. Uh, European market was uh, is where I'm working right now over the past couple of years. Uh, I've been working with Synergy Consultant Synergy Plan Solutions um, over the past two years. And today I'm going to share uh, with you the uh, functional insight, uh, I mean, the perspective from the clients, um, you know, the client's perspective about what they look for for when they hire people into the data science industry or uh, per se in the IT industry in itself. So I have a few things that I would like to share with you when it comes to uh, jobs and roles in the uh, data science. So uh, yeah, I can uh, see the slides. Yeah, so are the others able to see the slides? Can you respond back with an emoji? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So Rahul, you may okay. want to speak up a little bit higher. Uh, I believe some of them want uh, the audio seems to be slightly on the lower side. You may want to stay closer. Is it, to... is it better now? Uh, is the audio better? I, I'm able to hear. Okay. Perfect. Better? Okay. So I believe I'll have to put the microphone closer to my mouth. Nevertheless, that's fine. So uh, yeah, that's me. I've been working at Synergy. I mean, that's where I'm currently working. Uh, over the past three and a half years, I've been into talent acquisition and I've completed my bachelor's in technology back in 2017. So uh, let's begin. Uh, please move on to the next slide. So why a BSc degree? I mean, uh, to be honest with you, over the past uh, year, I've been really looking forward to, you know, getting into the data science industry myself. I mean, myself being from, uh, uh, you know, working into the talent acquisition uh, field, I wanted to be uh, working into that field hands on uh, with technical, uh, you know, competencies as well. So why a BSc degree? So uh, the reason why I opted for the BSc degree was uh, most of the certificate, most of the, uh, you know, data science uh, courses that were there online, say Great Lakes and, uh, you know, uh, all these portals that they have. So those were mainly certifications and those were uh, mostly like, uh, you know, six months, eight months, one year. And they probably had some prerequisite about, you know, you're supposed to know these uh, beforehand before getting into this. So I thought that probably a little bit risky because there was a prerequisite knowledge that you need to have. But over here, I went for a BSc degree because the course was really extensive. It was really, um, you know, uh, detailed. So that is why. Okay. Webex is asking me to turn off video. Uh, all right. So that is why I went for the BSc degree because I uh, went through the courses. I went through the subjects. It was really detailed. So I thought that would be something that would, uh, you know, educate me from the very basics. So uh, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the reasons why data science, because it's really trending nowadays and a lot of people are into it. And obviously the demand is high, but you know, most of the people working in the data science field have uh, primarily been uh, coming in from Python development with uh, data science, uh, you know, uh, certification training and a little bit of, uh, you know, work experience as well. So uh, I was looking forward to going in for uh, a degree because that would, uh, you know, educate me from the very basic level. Second thing, the brand value of such uh, an uh, industry. I mean, the brand value of, uh, IIT is something that really, um, you know, uh, makes a lot of heads turn. So that is one of the reasons why getting a degree from such a prestigious university was really important for me as well. Flexibility. So flexibility, because, uh, you know, you can choose uh, for the number of, you know, choose the number of uh, subjects that you want to uh, study over the next thing. I mean, if you uh, want to do it really quick, you can get it done in about two years and eight months. But if you Want to take it a bit slow, you can go for five uh, years as well. So that is one of the reasons which um, made me uh, choose this one because uh, it would really help me, uh, you know, uh, work it out while obviously working uh, uh, as well. 
and uh, one of the main reasons was i have been on the uh, hiring side on the uh, business side of uh, this industry and i wanted to really make a switch on to the technical side which really made me uh, think about you know going in for the data science uh, degree with iit madras can you please move so uh, like i said i mean the case studies will be a little bit different from uh, my other respected co speakers as well because obviously i'll uh, have to speak from uh, you know perspective from the perspective of a talent acquisition aspect wherein uh, the uh, clients aspect as well clients perspective as well so um, i mean obviously uh, this is the basic data science life cycle that we all need to follow while getting into this industry i mean this is something that we all uh, know already and if we don't we should know so uh, this also reflects and highlights the kind of skills and the processes that we need to follow i mean it starts with gathering data followed by cleaning them exploring them and modeling them and then moving on to the interpretation the end uh, result that we need out of that data the conclusive um, you know information that we need out of it uh, you can see the various skills that uh, various skills and tools that are used uh, in this uh, process all together it starts with collecting data obviously we need databases for that using postgresql mongodb oracle oracle or just sql as well cleaning data is mainly being done uh, using uh, python pandas sas map reduce and hadoop as well because we need to deal with uh, big data to some extent as well in the data uh, stages so um, the other uh, skills include r and um, you know cborn and tableau for data interpretation as well so uh, as you can see all throughout these five blocks these five uh, processes uh, python and r and sas are really important because python and r have so many um, you know libraries within themselves which help in uh, you know data in the data science life cycle to such an extent i mean you know you can only use python and r and few other data interpretation tools to get everything done and sorted in itself as well uh, can we please move so um yeah so over here from of course my perspective uh, of um, uh, into uh, talent acquisition i would like to show you you know an example of uh, what kind of hierarchical growth that you can get into data science i mean data science is not uh, limited to and restricted to having uh, you know working as a data scientist junior data scientist senior data scientist you know data science manager data science architect i mean the application of data science is huge it could be from financials to law to uh, you know and marketing anything here and there i mean it's all about data right we all work in a we all live in a world of data so interpreting that data processing that data into something useful is something that uh, you know entails data science right so one of uh, the career growth hierarchical career growth that you might be expected to see is you know you can start off with being a junior data scientist with uh, an experience around 1 to 2 years i mean as a fresher to 2 years followed by a senior uh, data scientist getting promoted and working there for around 3 to 5 years and on that very same level you have you know a uh, role as an ai and uh, ml engineer wherein you have to design create and deploy models as well and uh, the main skills over there are highlighted as well i mean python uh, um, natural language processing machine learning deep learning all these things are very important in this data science industry um, after that after a senior data scientist and ai ml engineer you might be getting an opportunity to be promoted to a principal data scientist uh, level wherein uh, your work uh, would uh, mostly be comprised of uh, you know functional Uh, responsibilities i mean as you grow in uh, you know hierarchically your work um, you know in addition to having te technical responsibilities as well your functional responsibilities do gain as well so as a principal data scientist your uh, job also includes you know discovering uh, new business opportunities you know leadership ex uh, excellence is also something that you should have because you have already led people in the um earlier stages of your career as well and that and that point of time you might have to do that as well followed by that you uh, might be able to uh, work as a data science manager or architect which is uh, one of the highest levels that you uh, might have to work and after that uh, you may uh, be going in for some other hierarchical levels as well so these are the kind of uh, 
you know stages that you uh, would have to go through if you choose to uh, study data science and um, this is only one of the ways one of the hierarchical career goals that you'll have there are many others and uh, the applications of data science is huge so it may not be this it could be something else and it's equally good so uh, the skills uh, yeah let's move on to the next one So the skills that uh, the data science professionals really need, I mean, the academic skill set that we are going to learn in this course, those include algorithmic interpretation, mostly being uh, done in, uh, you know, computational thinking that we have done in the first semester, followed by Python programming, which is coming in in the second and uh, in the diplomas as well. I believe there's a SQL is going to be taught. In addition to that, we have object-oriented programming using Java, I believe. And machine learning and deep learning is something that we are going to uh, study in the third year itself. Other than that, image processing and speech technology. Speech technology, I saw that on the uh, you know third year uh, subject options. And image processing is something that um, has been spoken about a lot. So I believe that is something that we are going to have to study as well. Other than that, uh, we um, might have to learn a lot about uh, the other skills which might help us secure a better a job wherein uh, you know there would be a lot of flexibility and a lot of options to choose from so that would uh, you know you would have to study oracle and non-sql databases like mongodb and uh, cassandra as well python and r is very important just like uh, my the previous uh, speaker uh, said mr uh, mohanty and um, when it comes to uh, large scale data processing, I mean, I'm not sure how many people are aware of Hadoop and Spark and MapReduce, but those are really important and in order to, uh, you know, handle data in bulk and uh, visualization. I mean, the last stage of uh, the data science life cycle that we all saw data visualization, that is really important. Uh, I mean, that is the stage wherein you would have to uh, have a conclusive approach about what uh, we have actually done and what are we actually going to do with this data and this information. Information. So that is uh, going to be visualized and represented using Tableau, Click View, and Power BI. That is something that we all have to do as well. So these are the skills that are mainly required. Uh, to just to, to much extent that the, this should probably be enough. But yes, there's always room to uh, learn more. So I would like to show you, uh, you know, uh, an example of what the clients look out for when it comes to um you know prospective job opportunities while working uh, into the uh, data science industry so this is an example this is a job opening this is live actually this is a live job opening uh, for microsoft in redmond washington so this is a principal uh, data and applied scientist manager so over there as you can see i mean the um, qualifications the required skills is pretty much extensive i mean you need to have 10 years of research or product experience in national processing, I mean, which is uh, something really important. And uh, when it comes to the core technical specificities, you have fluency with recent NLP and ML advancements. So, you know, you have always uh, have to, you know, be uh, skilled up to the level of the current market. You have to educate yourself consistently in order to, you know, uh, uh, compete with others in the uh, very same market and get yourself hired up and get yourself a better job. And other than that, hands-on experience in deep learning using frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, and strong coding skills in one or more of Python, C Sharp, or uh, C, C++. So this is where it uh, gets very tricky because Python is something, I mean, like I mentioned, most of the people working into data science have uh, had a Python background. So Python is really important and Python is something that we should all really go for while working in the data science industry. And since this is a very senior role, so experience with, I mean, uh, their expectation is a little bit uh, over the top. They are expecting PhD in computational linguistics as well. So this is something that the clients ideally look out for people, uh, uh, candidates who are going to be uh, hired for this role uh, over the next few weeks. So uh, getting yourselves uh, technically skilled and strong is really important. I mean, just academic knowledge is not enough. You need to, uh, you know, follow the market, understand uh, the most recent trends, and uh, get yourself upskilled with the real uh, you know, these technologies that are coming.
so i uh, now i would like to talk about managing different roles uh, so so persevering with the course so over here i mean in this course as a working professional um it has been pretty uh, challenging to some ex to much extent actually to be honest and it has been equally challenging for most of you as well people who are studying people who are working as well so people who are working are um, i mean they are managing two roles at the same time and studying and working and uh, to uh, educating yourselves on uh, two different colleges and two different fronts for students who are uh, still working on their uh, on campus uh, colleges and studying on their on campus colleges so it's uh, really difficult the most important aspect of which is time management so the challenges that i have faced uh, while um, that a lot of people might have to face in uh, pursuing this course is the approach to e learning i mean not a lot of people are comfortable in e learning so the transition from traditional learning to e learning is really important you need to be absolutely uh, you know focused on what is being said but you know if you want to take it in a uh, you know interesting way e learning is something that should really help you it should uh, turn out to be better than you know on site uh, uh, you know on campus colleges time management across the week time management across the week is really critical i mean um there was probably a form um or some kind of a questionnaire in the beginning wherein uh, we were asked about the expected time we will be uh, you know able to give in for this course so there was something in between 2 to 3 hours 5 hours 7 hours 10 hours 12 hours so make no mistakes it sounds like 2 3 hours is uh, enough it actually is but then 2 to 3 hours of consistent uh, studying 5 days a week along with the job is kind of difficult so time management is very important it's very crucial so you should really have um, you know you should not uh, waste a single minute i mean you should always keep yourself motivated so what i try to do is you know my approach to um, you know uh, these challenges and um, um, managing them as you know going through the videos as quickly as possible instead of procrastinating what i try to do is uh, finishing everything that's uh, been given over the um you know uh, five days i mean the courses gets released every week on monday so what i try to do is get them sorted every um, every week by friday and get the graded questions done by saturday or sunday so that you know i can not uh, you know lag behind it the next week uh, courses come in on uh, next monday so how does that help me in the initial stages what i was facing with the difficulties that i had was a uh, lack of time for quiz prep because you know the activity uh, i mean sorry the graded assignments don't stop when the quiz is coming right so uh, what i rahul, do is uh, i just try to... uh, alert rahul can you keep the mic a little bit closer i think the most important part is missed out by a lot of students they are asking more questions now <laughs> okay okay sorry uh yeah non academic skill set when will be the right time to pursue those i mean you can per assume uh, most of those as soon as possible but you are not please i warn all of you don't take any wrong steps don't jeopardize uh, your education because you're working you're studying two different degrees together and managing those two is difficult in itself already so don't jeopardize uh, and risk uh, put those two uh, degrees at risk by you know going through some extra um, uh, upskilling uh, that is not being academically taught so do that at your own pace at your own time but don't try to jeopardize your uh, uh, two degrees that you're pursuing so uh, yes like i was saying the time management is very important because uh, every week uh, the courses keep coming in although we are given 10 10 days of time to submit the graded assignments but try to do everything within 6 to 7 days because uh, uh, i'm pretty sure a lot of people have faced this issue i mean uh, you uh, before the quiz um you probably much time to prepare for the same so if you lag behind if you use all the 10 days to solve the graded assignments you are definitely going to be messed up for the quiz so the, the trick uh, for uh, you know solving the uh, graded assignments and you know uh, giving yourself enough time for preparing for the quizzes is to uh, you know complete all the graded assignments in time in just about 5 uh, to 6 days so that you don't lag behind when the quizzes come in and um there's one more thing that i would like to put a bit of uh, emphasis on because um 
you know if you waste a lot of time on social media which is uh, of course something that everyone does but you have to keep yourself limited to the social media usage and of course you have to control yourselves and um, you know um, put yourself in a position that you have to get this done in about five to six days otherwise uh, i myself have uh, messed it up big time in the first uh, in the second quiz uh, by uh, because i could not manage it uh, uh, properly and I took a lot of time to get the graded assignments done and I ended up having a lot less time to prepare for the quiz. So the biggest trick is getting all those things done. I mean the quizzes are getting released on uh, uh, Monday the 1st. Try to get them uh, sorted and solved by six, uh, Saturday the 6th. That is the biggest thing that you have to do. Could we move on? Okay. Yes, other broad challenges and coping strategies. I mean, like I mentioned, um, balancing the work, study, and you know, uh, the intensity of work and domestic responsibilities and everything since COVID has obviously increased. I mean, let's uh, not pretend that uh, it has not affected uh, any of us. It has, and it is supposed to in uh, affect all of us. So balancing all three is very important and uh, your responsibilities have definitely increased but it's all about wasting as uh, less time as possible and not being lazy about it and what i try to do to uh, you know cope up uh, with these kind of you know quick and busy uh, hectic schedule that we have got is you know i uh, you know i lean on a little bit of uh, music i um, get a bit dependent on you know a mix of uh, high and low intensity music so that helps a lot i mean in between a work and uh, studies you have to uh, give yourself some time uh, so that your uh, dedication and your attention doesn't get uh, hindered so that is something you can all try for i mean this is my mantra to get it done uh, you yours might be something else and yes lastly um, this is very important i mean i've seen a lot of people in different groups and different meets i mean uh, um, you know, because of the marks that you have got in the quizzes or the end terms, don't feel dejected about the uh, scores that you've got and don't compare. Learners, even if you do compare, don't feel bad about, I mean, uh, this person has got this much marks, I have got this much marks. Don't do that. If you want to focus, if you want to grow, if you want to do better, please, uh, my advice is try to discuss it with your friends, but don't create, uh, a, you know, group. Uh, large enough to have uh, you know so many opinions and ultimately you gain nothing out of it so what i try to do is study in groups of three with uh, specific people and that helps me a lot thank you Okay, here comes another round of uh, standing ovations. Uh, we have around 180 participants. Rahul, that was uh, uh, that was a wonderful talk. I mean, you uh, gave us an insight into the other aspects of how the growth is in terms of uh, uh, the different roles uh, within the company because you are specializing in talent acquisition. That was really wonderful. But yeah, I would have said you could have taken a lower level role because most of them are now feeling super depressed looking at the Microsoft uh, <laughs> job <laughs> requirements. I mean, I chose for Microsoft because that was really, that would have, you know, turned a lot of heads and made people excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a very, it was a very high role. I mean, PhDs are basically the uh, problem solvers, I mean, uh, open problem Actually. solvers, those kind of people. So, <laughs> and that role was, I mean, I just came across that role today in the afternoon itself. I mean, they are asking for someone with over 10 to 15 years of experience into NLP. So, that's intense. Yeah. That's intense. Absolutely, absolutely. So, thanks, Rahul. And uh, with this, I'll uh, open the door to the final speaker of the day. Uh, Shantanu, uh, Shantanu, I have actually downloaded the uh, presentation that you shared uh, mm -hmm. at my end. Uh, so okay. if you are not able to... Uh... Uh, let me try and share first. So let's see how it yeah, works yeah, out. Sure. Okay, I can see your screen. So... So is it visible, uh, my presentation? 
Yes, yes, it is visible, Shantan. Okay, and my voice is also okay, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so right. uh, yeah, so I hope there are a lot of depressed uh, souls over here, and I hope Shantanu will cheer them up by the end of the, his presentation. No, okay. no, I mean, I, I mean, two great perspectives from you know two very different uh, you know parts of uh, the industry. Okay. And, and I mean, probably, you know, some things which I'm going to talk has already been covered by you too. But I mean, let me also talk about uh, a use case, which will be pretty interesting to all of you. I mean, which I worked almost very recently. Uh, so, you know, without much ado, so let me just quickly, you know, uh, start. So I have roughly around 15 years of experience, you know, um, all throughout in IT, right? I have been working for different organizations and currently I'm with IBM for past six years and I'm analytics and data uh, architect position and um, although i deal in a lot of technologies uh, my specialization is with sap right so people might have heard about sap because it is widely used um, across you know different uh, uh, fortune 500 companies to say the least and also medium and small enterprises okay across the entire world um, okay my current role is that you know i am working for a sustainable oil and gas uh, customer and i help them build strategize and deliver analytic solution as a part of their erp transformation program i mean it's a very unique customer so i mean i don't have time now but i can talk about it maybe sometime later because people have been asking about you know how do you how do you gain functional knowledge okay but let me be very frank functional knowledge comes only with experience and there is no shortcut to it so it's only when you start working in real life projects, you in real life, you know, customers, you understand their business. That's when, you know, you come to know. But not not to, to dishearten anybody. I mean, there are other ways to do it, but yeah, it will come with time. And other than my project work, I mean, I am also involved in a lot of, uh, you know, so I'm, for example, a part of a co-member of the SAP HANA Center of Excellence. So people who doesn't know SAP HANA is basically a technology platform is kind of a in memory so don't be you know too much confused about the word so if you have heard about it very well if you don't don't be too much confused so just think it in terms of a platform where you can build and develop your application so i'm a part of that center of excellence team uh, in ibm cit india um, and also i have got a numerous publications in ibm academy of technology on ai and data science platform so basically in, in ibm what we have to do is that we have to create a lot of assets, right? Which we, which we can tell to the customer. Okay, so this is what IBM thinks about something. So for example, you, you, you are a data um, scientist or a data science provider and you have a, a, a strong background. So IBM has got a very strong presence in, in AI and machine learning, right? It has a separate research team. It has got a lot of products. So for example, you know, if you have heard about um, SPSS, so it was acquired by IBM quite some time back and uh, we have got um, this IBM Watson, so which is basically a cognitive tool, and it and it uh, caters to a, a lot of use cases. So mostly in and around unstructured data. So when I say unstructured, just think it in terms of you know all the videos that you see on the YouTube, all the images, all the text that, that are coming. So it primarily works on that because you know I mean unstructured data is uh, I mean all all pervasive I mean it's everywhere right you know data in structured form is actually very less if I if I were to think in that way uh, so uh, so uh, I also work as a part of that team in and and we have different publications so I have to you know come up with that uh, from time to time I also off late have been working on disclosure and patent filings in AI and ML space so so yeah, I mean, IBM is one of the largest. So it's the largest probably patent filing company in the entire world, right? And it has been doing so year after year. So probably six or seven years, it has been the forerunner in the number of patents that are filed in each year. And patent, I mean, it's it's completely, you know, comes from the innovation space. So we have started, uh, I, um, so we have started our patent filing journey in that space and, and, and hopefully uh, I should be able to, you know, file something maybe this year. And in other time also, I'm co-authoring a SAP press book. So this book is also uh, on, on a very innovative SAP product, which has come off very late. So which is probably, you know, due for publication in this year. So, so those are my, you know, kind of a day in what I do. Okay. And so uh, why, why, why certainly this course, because I have been doing different POCs and different, you know, organization activities in and around data science for almost last three to four years. And I've done a lot of certificate courses here and there to be very frank, but you know, but I mean, when you go 
uh, in unstructured format, you basically are going to get confused because you see a plethora of courses. For example, if you go to Coursera or even for NPTEL for that matter, where I have done some courses. So, so why not you know go for a very structured and a organized way where you can you know correlate uh, everything. I mean, all the way from your basic statistics and mathematics up to machine learning, and then when you deep dive. Uh, from machine learning into something like you know deep learning and all your neural networks and everything else so so i thought you know let's do this and and i'm probably i'll talk about it why i took this course and uh, so i am basically an engineering graduate uh, way back so because i have 15 years so almost i mean i have to now uh, be a student so which itself is a big challenge for me but however i mean i have kind of you know successfully done it for the first time and hopefully i should be able to continue next forward Okay, so why uh, the BS degree, as I was telling, I mean, I have done a lot of uh, POCs. Uh, so why POCs? Okay, now if I talk about projects, okay, so there are uh, customers, right? I have seen because, I mean, IBM has got a huge kitty of, uh, say, the big customers or the Fortune 500 companies as they talk about, right? So most of them are very skeptical when it comes to, you know, implementing a project on data science. Why? Uh, firstly, they really need guidance. So they really don't know so most of them when i talk to they say that they have something in idea and because everybody is talking about ai machine learning data science so theory so they also want to do something and obviously i mean all the product vendors have their latest technology stack for example be it the sap's the oracles right the microsoft's or the aws or the google cloud platform everybody has something or the other on machine learning and everybody wants to sell right when they sell their product so obviously they want to invest their time they want to invest their money into it because i mean they might already might have invested because they have brought the product but they do not have the confidence so it's it's kind of a, a, a gap so where in which we can fill so we mean we as an industry expert because we can help them in designing the use cases because we have people who have been working in the functional domain for years right so we have a huge amount of you know functional exposure across all the industries i mean just name it because we have you know, kind of different uh, industrial sectors which we work from then we have the cross industry sectors so why not leverage that knowledge and kind of educate the customers but then you know a typical data science project is not only about functional knowledge so that's just one person or one part of the story uh, the rest of it is also knowing you know how to talk technology or how to talk machine learning and ai so so it becomes very imperative for a person who is kind of selling this product uh to the customer he also knows i mean he also knows about machine learning algorithms for a very simple example i say so that's why i thought that okay so it's probably the right uh, uh, right time for me to invest in something like this and also because uh, this is iit madras i mean obviously i mean when you complete the course you will be an iit address alumnus and i mean when you say that word i mean there is uh, i mean nothing else uh, that you know you need to talk about yourself uh, the second thing, the third thing was the flexibility uh, and the time frame because uh, I mean, I'm a working professional. I do not have really the forecast over the next one year what I'm going to work on. So, for example, if something very challenging comes up and because I have a traveling job, so I have to travel quite often. Now, I'm not traveling because of this uh, COVID situation, but because I have to travel, then I, it might difficult. It might become difficult for me to, you know, uh, especially attend the in-person quizzes and all. So, it gave me the flexibility, for example, if I want to drop a term and maybe take it on from the next time onwards. So it helps me to plan better. And obviously there is a lot of robustness and rigor in the course that is being taught. And I knew this because I'd already done some NPTEL courses uh, earlier on the same platform. And I did a, a 12 week course and I gave an in-center exam. So I really knew, I mean, what I was signing up to. So, so these are the main drivers for which I chose this program, right? Okay. Now, um, Coming to a real life example, you know, so I have chosen a case study which uh, we had uh, done. So I have done this for uh, something we call as SAP TechEd. So SAP every year uh, does this uh, technical education. So it happens in three to four uh, cities over the entire world. So this time it was virtual. So we did uh, something, uh, a use case for their brand new product, which is called SAP Data Intelligence. So SAP Data Intelligence is a product which supports this um, machine learning, uh, out the data science project, the entire life cycle of it. So we did uh, one uh, use case for that, and that use case was actually uh, a kind of uh, driven by uh, our customer POC that I had done some time earlier. So it was related to an automotive industry. And what we had to do is that, so whenever you probably, uh, I mean, people who doesn't know, so whenever you go to, uh, whenever you think of a car, right, a car has got several thousand parts of it, and they all need to be assembled. 
and and there are a lot of welding events that go on right for example if you have a door of a car so there may be thousands of welding event that goes on to um, weld that particular car and then fix it to the body of it so obviously everything is not done by hand so like you know 60 to 70 percent of all the plants which produce cars uh, are automated and there are robots that are working on it now say for example if in any assembly line if any of the robot breaks down then what happens right so um, so the the the, um, the the production for that particular supply line stops right and then it might then hit your supply and then what it means that you are not able to fulfill your customer demand so what this customer wanted is that if uh, by looking at different data points so they have different sources of data if we could predict okay uh, within a reasonable time frame that whether this uh, robot which has a robotic welding arm is going to fail probably in the next hour or so so that was the, exactly the question which the business asked so we uh, kind of uh, thought about it we had extensive uh, discussions with the business that's where the communication which uh, my earlier colleagues were talking about uh, had uh, had emphasized so communication with the business is very important and also you need to have an industry expert so who will ask the right questions to the business so we identified the different sources of data different data points uh, we then apply different techniques how to choose the correct data because i mean not all data might be good for your analysis right and then uh, once we got all the data we then had to create a platform uh, so it was a sap customer so they had all the sap tools and technologies in the landscape so what we did is that we uh, chose three different use cases right so a couple of them were related to you know supervised machine learning so again don't be too much uh, you know uh, be confused by the terminologies if you know that's fine if you don't know that's okay i will probably try to give you a one liner on them and then we had one use cases which was for a, a supervised learning so we thought about three use cases and, and the data that we uh, wanted to leverage was a mix of sap data as well as sensor based data so when you say sensor you must have heard about this word which is called you know maybe not or maybe so which is called iot or internet of things right so when you you have so many devices connected devices right say for example your mobile your mobile itself is an iot device which churns thousands of or other millions of uh, records per minute maybe from your different applications that you access right so now what do you do with this data so this uh, uh, data you can actually analyze and you can you know discover trends or pattern within so we kind of assimilated both the sap and this sensor based data and we created the three uh, different use cases which i will you know briefly talk about it so what was the business benefit obviously you know predicting something that whether a robotic welding arm is going to fail or not is obviously you know something that uh, any sort of standard analytics cannot tell you beforehand right and if you know something is gonna break so probably it's always good to do a preventive health check health checkup rather than you know waiting for it to fail and then fix it which will you know bring down your assembly line anyways so so that was uh, a benefit and obviously i mean if you know something is going to fail your maintenance cost will also be uh, you know lowered and uh, and also you will be able to manage your inventory better in the sense that you will know you know what are the spare parts that you need to order beforehand given that you know this machine is likely to fail in the near future so it it helps in you know reducing those type of costs as well uh this is a very sample solution architecture that we used right so as i told you that this is uh, mainly you know in and around uh, the sap space so again if you don't know about it don't be worried so for example sap leonardo iot is the internet of things uh, devices that we talked about right it has got you know different components uh, which i will not talk in detail because it will probably confuse you uh, so sap mii is kind of an interface probably you know which reads your physical assets so for example in the bottom you can see one robot so it reads the robot data and kind of passes it on to this internet of things so we think to think it in the think it uh, in terms as a platform right where you can you know read your data and then we have different other components as well so for example you can see sap data intelligence which is talking about so this is where this is one place where you, you know gather collect you clean your data you make it ready for your machine learning analysis that you're trying to do and then you also put it to production so it's not only about the analysis but putting it into production is also very essential and important because you want this algorithms to run day in and day out and probably multiple times within a day so then there needs to be a framework where everything is automated and and probably you know 
it also talks about things like you know when you need to retrain your model because data is ever changing and without retraining your model is going to be soon outdated right so so those all things are kind of you know taken care of by something which is called you know uh, machine learning ops or operations so that is also supported by sap data intelligence and sap hana platform as i told you is primarily is one of the databases so where is where we used to uh, where we had used in order to store our data and 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 the entire data science uh, journey is not too much understandable to the end user or the business community because they don't understand what is a machine learning output right if you talk to them these are the performance metrics they will not understand anything about it because they are not from that background so you know what to in order to make them understand you have to create some sort of a storyboards or a storyline so that they can understand it in terms of you know uh, in in business parlance if i say in that manner so that is what we did in something called the sap clanities cloud which is a uh, a dashboard kind of story so i will not probably go very deep into the use cases so probably i'll just you know quickly tell you and uh, this slides anyways will be shared so you take your own time and understand and if you have any questions you can again always come back to me i will help you in understanding this so uh, there is a data science methodology that you need to follow for example there are six to seven steps so we ibm has got their own uh, foundational methodology for data science we followed that and then we the first use cases was you know kind of detecting anomalies uh, in current and voltage reading so welding events are associated with you know current and voltage so because you need some power in order to do a welding event and when you see any sort of anomaly probably it's something uh, to raise an alarm and then you take some sort of a corrective action so different anomaly strategies or algorithms were used for example we used isolation forest in order to find out what are the probable anomalies and then uh, there were different strategies for example finding local and global anomalies and then we use this for one of our storyboards i will show you what are the storyboards that we did uh, the second use case was uh, you know uh, was related so so the first one is uh, uh, a typical example of unsupervised learning so for example you do not know the output before end so that's what unsupervised learning means the second use case was more related to a supervised learning so for example you you have a history of failure so you knew that okay this robot had failed uh, for for example in the last one year at this points of time so what you do is you ana you analyze all your uh, all your uh, input data set so input data set can be you know what was the current and voltage reading when the machine had failed so what were the different you know messages that came out and what are the count of those messages when the machine had failed so you take all this as an input data and you have the output which is your failure so failure is again kind of a binary so i mean it has failed which is yes or no which is uh, so zero so it's either one or zero it's a binary target and uh, i I'm, i'm giving it just a simple example of a binary classifier here so we use different algorithms uh, so an ensemble probably uh, as simple as logistic regression uh, to different uh, other algorithms like svms and then we took the best among them which gave us the mm, uh, good uh, testing results so so this was the uh, Uh, this was a use case wherein we had kind of predicted so for example if the machine is healthy within the current hour so for example from 7 to 8 pm if the machine is healthy what is the likelihood or what is the what is the uh, chance that it is going to fail from say 8 to 9 so that is what the use case is and it's kind of a rolling event and it did for the uh, every hour so that was what we did for the second use case uh, so i was talking about the sap analytics you know dashboard journey uh, so uh, this is how you represent your data Uh, and tell it to the customer so for example in the graph here you can see those red points are basically your anomalies so for example if you do a time series plot of your data so you can tell the customer okay these are the records which seems to be anomalies and probably you know uh, you can you know have a look across different robots as you see here uh, the second uh, user story was related to event message mining so which i did not discuss so this is like you know so for example if you have a failure messages which are preceded by say 10 different messages so for example when those 10 different messages again happen in the future so there is a chance that the failure might happen so it is typically called a uh, kind of a sequence mining or a message mining okay and we did some sort of an a priori analysis in order to do that so so we identified those rules so this is also another form of unsupervised learning because again we do not know what those rules are and the rules keep on changing as on as uh, new data comes in but but the good thing is that you only augment your rule book so for example the ones which has got you know more Uh, better performance right you can say probably with surety okay so if these messages are happening in sequence so there is a chance that my machine might fail so it's kind of an alarm system that you you can actually trigger based on this 
and the third output as i said okay so this actually kind of predicts the kind of you know so even though it shows zero 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 so it's kind of estimates the time to fail uh, failure for the uh, robot that you have chosen so probably when the machine is going to fail as per my input data set okay so a lot of other parameters are there i'm not going to okay discuss because it's going to confuse you and uh, so how programming obviously helps so uh, if i talk about this use cases we had used sap mii so which is like manufacturing integration and intelligence so we had used xml and server side javascript in order to interact with the web services okay uh, in sap data intelligence pipeline we had a custom r script for uh, you know doing some file processing which we had stored on the s3 storage uh, it's because we used sap hana as a database then obviously the structured query language is the one which we'll use in order to create our data models uh, our machine learning scenarios were created using python in jupyter lab so python and jupyter lab probably you know, everybody is going to learn in the next uh, next term or next semester and this is integrated with sap data intelligence if you talk it from a tool perspective and uh, in order to make it you know production ready we had to interact the python with different apis in order to ensure i mean these are those jobs or those machine learning jobs are kind of running day in and day out and, and there are different benchmarks or thresholds that you can set for uh, uh, learning and relearning and in sse or the sap analytics studio where we actually build the user story boards we also used uh, different ggplot libraries in order to augment our uh, uh, library so basically you can do a lot of coding there in order to uh, create custom charts so which is probably not possible uh, by the inbuilt by libraries which sap provides so in summary it's a mix of database programming application program programming and visualization programming uh, were widely used uh, in this poc okay so this is something i think which we are already talking about and you know what happens probably you know a day in the life of a data science so i, I find this slide very interesting because you know it probably talks about the different life cycles of where do we start so you know it starts with the very very first where we have to understand the use case right then finding the correct data is also very essential because i mean you have to understand with the industry expert which which data is going to make sense and then if you have the data in that time frame from all the different sources which probably is going to feed into your model then we have to explore and understand for example you have to explore what type of data is it then uh, then uh, whether you need to do any sort of harmonization and cleaning so that comes as the next step okay and then uh, we have to extract the features out of it so features was you know where is wherein we have kind of the dependent and independent variables so these are all the independent variables then you choose your model you train them right and you deploy your models and they monitor your health so then there is a feedback loop that you see here so for example if you see that your model performance has gone down that's probably your input data set might have changed right so you this is the time for retraining it so you go and retrain it and you see that if there are any input parameters new parameters that have been added so you kind of uh, aug uh, augment your model with those three parameters and then you just you know go on with the update so in in uh, pink here you see different roles or different personas that you know a person uh, who is in a data science project can play so for example you can be a data steward or a data engineer you can be a data scientist okay you can be a person who uh, specializes in production for example the operation side of it you can be an app developer and you can be a, also a person who is the business executive or the data science leader or the thought leader who you know kind of manages and governs the entire process so there are different personas and also there is another person that i forgot to mention that is the mm, industry expert because obviously i mean every use case is unique so for example this use case when i probably want to implement it in other another automobile industry probably it may not be exactly the same so you may have to find you so that's where the industry expert is very essential because he knows about the functioning of the business uh, uh, probably you know with experience for last 10 15 years or more so that is so there are different personas and probably you know by looking at this you would uh, you know try to understand you know how or where do you really fit in so somebody asked me you know why what has java to do so java probably is widely used in application development and as most of them are web based applications nowadays right so so it's widely used there in application development because ultimately your machine learning has to be used so probably you won't give your algorithm to your end user and ask them to execute so they won't make sense so it has to be in a format which is consumable and understandable for the by the business so that's where probably you would create an app and then when you click a button so probably that button will in the back end might 
trigger some machine learning algorithm and then it will show the output for example you know uh, the demand forecasting uh, as uh, david smith was talking about in his first uh, uh, first lecture right first uh, presentation so so those things happen in the back end and those complexities need to be hidden and that's where the application development plays a very important role in making it readable to the uh, wider business community so okay again these are again you know something which i you know quickly just you know talked about and and if you if you talk about our courses that are there so uh, already you know lined up in the diploma for example you know there are programming concepts there are modern application development which will be catering to the application developer data engineer uh, probably you know data manage, database management system business data management are the courses we will cater to this and data scientist i think it's it's everywhere so starting from machine learning to different tools and then when you probably go into the third year so there are a lot of specializations which focuses in and around machine learning so so there are certain specializations for data engineer as well uh, in the in the third year so i haven't mentioned but you know this is just an indicative of how the courses that are there already in our curriculum is going to you know help you or uh, you know develop or define yourself as a as as that persona in the entire data data science life cycle uh, the non academic skill sets okay so the know how of the domain and tech, uh, domain or industry which is related to the business problem so this frankly speaking you cannot do it alone you need to have the help of an sme because for people like me who across you know works cross industry right so i do not know everything but then since i have been working for the oil and gas for the last four years probably that's where something where i can uh, you know give you some idea but if you had to ask me say for example insurance domain probably i won't be able to do so for example so it's it's not good to make any guesses so it's always best to go to the expert because you work here with a team you are not a solo performer because a data science team will so a data science uh, project will involve a lot of people so there are people from the functional background there are business people right there are people who are the it support so for example they help you there are the application developers right there is the data scientists who are the core of entire things who builds or uh, kind of designs your algorithm so so these are all needed and at the end of the day as i said that good presentation and articulation skills are very important because you should be able to articulate the result of whatever experiment or whatever analysis you have done uh, to your customer because if you are not able to explain so even if so if, if you, even if you have uh, ran a very complex or a complicated deep learning algorithm using tensorflow they might uh, you know uh, hear very nice words to somebody who is very technical but to a person who is not technical at all it would be all all like you know what are you talking about talk in my language so you should be able to articulate that results and and believe me in any sort of a data science project the end part is obviously the visualization or the or the ss story board that i talked about and also probably a nice deck wherein you you know talk about you know how you do approach the problem what problem you solved and what were your end results so, and whether they are repeatable or not okay coming um, okay so that was uh, all about my experience in the data science project now managing about different roles okay now it's a very very difficult thing for me because i have been thinking of doing a certain courses you know for last 3 or 4 years and i have seen my friends who have done probably certificate courses and some even degree courses but then i was always thinking whether i will be able to manage the time or not but then uh, i saw this course and this has got so much amount of flexibility because as i said that you can skip certain terms and you can go ahead and you know register yourself after a, a brief hiatus maybe so 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 that was the perfect thing that was needed for me and and, and in terms of the courses it's also totally depends on how many you really want to take in one semester so depending on your workload so for me i mean i'm trying to go all out as of now okay so given that i have uh, i have the prerequisites met so i'm trying to do as much as possible because i'm trying to finish it up but then don't follow my strategy you have to uh, keep in mind you know for example if i do not have the visibility of what work i'm going to have next year or maybe next to next year so if the work pressure increases obviously i have to cut down the time uh, that i'm spending on this course and then i have to you know devote more time on my professional front and as i said that i have a traveling job so if i travel obviously that naturally becomes a hard stop for me at least for that duration so and then i was also trying to attend four courses at one go so my pedagogy was okay because i come from a english speaking background so that 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 particular subject probably you know was easy for me so i thought that i could manage time with the subjects which are relatively uh, new or which needed a bit of uh, uh, a refresher because i had learned statistics as a part of my 11th and 12th curriculum but then as you can remember that i have been working for 15 years i have almost forgotten everything so so and you know some things 
do not uh, get refreshed without i mean without any practice for example everybody would agree that if you had to solve any probability problems i mean even if you know all the concepts unless you practice you will never get them right so so that was one thing which actually helped me in 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 uh, you know refreshing that knowledge and um, and uh, as rahul rightly mentioned that i also try to stay ahead of the deadlines and you know how i how i uh, you know plan my activities so i try to go all out on my weekdays because that is when i do my uh, day job as well so weekends i try to keep a uh, little bit because i try to keep my uh, time for my family because obviously i have also a little kid whom i have to give time to so so that is how i manage my time as of now and um, and i try to focus on my week areas and uh, and summarize new concept in the form of written notes so written notes actually help me out because you know when i have to summarize across weeks and across terms maybe in the future so probably i can just go back to my notes and you know quickly just have a glance and remember you know what i had studied uh, or rather what was the summary of the um, area that i was you know not uh, working properly and i also try to ensure that i you know score sufficiently so that i can i can enroll in desired number of courses because i say that i have a strategy in mind for each year and i know i try to ensure that you know i i try to you know come uh, be able to succeed in their strategy and for that whatever prerequisites are, are needed i have to uh, kind of uh, attain those okay so so that is all probably i had to talk and i hope i had made it within the time uh, i can go hours speaking but then in the interest of time uh, probably this is all what i had shared and i'm always there as a part of your student community i'm learning with all of you so if you want to you know know anything about my experience you are uh, always welcome so thank you uh thank you uh, shantanu uh, i hope you can see the standing ovation that you are getting along with all the emojis uh, over here so i mean to all the speakers uh, what you have so what i see is uh, a very diverse uh, professional experience among all three of you uh catering to different areas um, different kind of roles also i mean that's that's the key aspect of it um yeah and uh, uh, again you uh, a couple of things that uh, i believe will be the top priority i mean uh, you may not get most of the technical questions from uh, uh, your uh, uh, peers but i think a lot of non academic questions are there uh, i mean queued up for you Uh, if you actually look at the chat there are a lot of these uh, questions that are there so what i'll do right now is uh, so if it is all right with all three of you uh, i'll just open up uh, the uh, floor to the audience uh, can uh, can you uh, raise your hands uh, so that uh, then we'll uh, have individual people who are in the top list i'll uh, i'll unmute yourself and so that you can start Uh, you can put the question, and uh, if there, if you want to address a question to a very specific speaker, please do let us. Uh, please do uh, announce it so that uh, the speaker will also be aware. I hope it's all right with all three of you. Uh, Devas, me, Rahul, and Shantanu. Yes, it's yeah, fine. that's fine. Okay, so uh, please raise your hands, and uh, Rahul and Shantanu, if you can just uh, uh, switch on your video so that uh, your peers can see you. Uh, i mean it's all virtual right now but uh, it would be nice to see you uh, uh, interacting with them yeah yeah thanks okay the first question uh, is uh, is going to be mahesh kumar mahesh kumar can you unmute yourself and uh, ask your question mahesh is logged in using a mobile if i'm not mistaken mahesh yes, please sir. go ahead very good evening everyone Yeah, it was very yeah, nice. Talk. Yes, sir. So, like, uh, I'm a student of masters in economics, and uh, like, I just need some guidance regarding internship in like related data analytics and data science, like in this field. So, how to like how to approach some companies or how to approach some individuals to get internships? Can you guide through this? okay mahesh so uh, i believe this might be a common query so for all those people who are having internship queries so let me put it to all three uh, uh, speakers 
uh, uh, whoever wants to go first, let me know. Uh, I will just broaden it, uh, it a little so that Mahesh's query is addresses a little bit more. So what are the things that a typical student should do uh, while approaching uh, some company or uh, uh, entrepreneur for uh, internship? What are the some of the essential skill set? So since you are from a professional background, some of the skill set that you look forward in an intern. If you can address these two, I think the remaining part is is pretty open, uh, and I think I will advise all students uh, uh, to look at these two aspects of it. The internship will come your way automatically. Yeah, uh, whoever wants to take this, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, who wants to go? You want to take it first, Shantanu? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, we have um, a kind of. Uh, 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 what do you say? A, a mentorship program. So, wherein we look in for volunteers and interns from colleges, right? So, what we do is that we have a lot of, you know, proof of concepts or POC projects that go around, and there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, data related activities because that is the very first step where you need to understand, you collect, and there are obviously different strategies of how to collect the data, right? So, and uh, then there is a lot of need for programmers because. Uh, a, a data scientist typically would be uh, the person who is already there. So typically the PhD guys or something. So we are well established uh, within the organization and uh, they need a lot of, you know, uh, a supporting cast initially, right? So because, I mean, you cannot, well, to be very frank, you cannot expect to go as an intern and, you know, start building your own machine learning algorithm. So, so a, a Python developer, say, for example, or an API developer, application programmer, so, you know, people who are very well conversant with JavaScript and all. So don't be disheartened if you are not desiring the algorithm, but you are a part of a bigger journey. So that's where you learn, right? So because being on a project and learning from somebody who is an expert is how, how you can do it. So in IBM, we have such programs. So we are always on the lookout of volunteers, but those uh, programs durations are maybe, you know, six months or eight months, depending on how long it is. And 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 that's how we engage. And those are typically the skills that we, you know, uh, look for. Yeah. Shantanu. So uh, uh, Rahul, you want to take a shot? Um. Well, to be honest, I believe uh, when it comes to uh, landing yourself a job into this industry, uh, what most of the clients would. Uh, probably uh, look out for would prefer i believe uh, uh, shantanu would um, agree with me on this one as well and people like to uh, hire people who are you know um, who are properly skilled in almost all of the uh, phases that is i mean uh, someone who is well versed with visualization tools someone who's well versed with python r most of the models developed and all that i mean they look for someone who can get everything done on on his own that is something that the clients look out for ideally. But if you have almost uh, more or less all of around 60, 70, 80 percent of the skills as well, I mean, that's good. But since you have time, I mean, it's just only the first day. I think there's a lot of time to grow and to learn a lot of skills over the next uh, two and a half, three years uh, so as to be absolutely completely uh, skilled uh, to get any project done. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, Devasmith. Yeah, I think uh, at least I can share my perspective. Uh, when we hire intern, we almost look at interns as somebody who will come and do a project. And at the end of the project, we are almost 50 to 60 percent sure that we want to hire that person as a full time employee. Right. So uh, to add to what the previous speakers have said, uh, see, it's it's not about the money and all that. It's like when you are joining uh, as an intern, you should you are expected to contribute something to either uh, internal project like POC and all that. So I would advise that since it's a three year program, you probably take internship after at, at a diploma level or a degree level, because then uh, your skill set will be much more higher. And in case you are given an offer that you can actually accept and continue full time, right? So that I think will be a, from a timing perspective. I think it's too early to talk about internship. That's just my personal view. Yeah, and a general question to all three of you: Is there something like a minimum? I mean, you, do you look at GPAs or uh, scores in general when you look at uh, interns, or is it just the SOP and the kind of skill sets? I think I can tell you that GPA is not a good predictor of success. Uh, I think after 20 years, uh, we realized that. Uh, 
that Once, feature is not a it will be removed from your uh, algo right <laughs> when it comes to it and uh, <laughs> not only not only that if you talk to many uh, bay area companies or startups mm -hmm. where a lot of friends uh, I, i think you know people are looking for skills and attitude right you know attitude is very important you have a learning attitude it will take you to places right gpa is something you know uh, at least you can mug up and you know get it but attitude is everything right so so i don't think we look at gpa per se I mean, of yeah. course, there's a minimum. You have to score at least whatever six plus or whatever. But but I think your skill set is more important and attitude is more important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any yeah. So is there something like a company policy, Shantanu, in IBM regarding GPA? Uh, because I believe certain types. Uh, yeah, as I said, the, I mean, as uh, the Vishnu said that there is a certain minimum criteria, but then probably you know there would be you know one round of uh, informal discussion. So it's not really like an interview, but. to understand what sort of skill sets you possess because you know how how good marks you are at the end of the day i mean i always keep telling okay it's how it's the knowledge that you have gained not the marks that you have scored so that is what is evaluated and if we deem that is uh, you know fine as per the sop then probably we uh, you know take that uh, person as an intern um, on to our projects yeah uh, rahul uh, coming from exactly talent acquisition part uh i know that you will have that as a first filter criteria so any thoughts on gpa <laughs> i mean uh, not really actually gpa is something that i mean of course uh, you need to have some kind of an a minimum eligibility uh, as well i mean something around 60% that most of the companies look out for but other than that it's all about what you do at the interview and what you have done and portfolios matter as well what you have done what you can showcase what you can show others what you have actually done a personal projects or helping out a friend something or the other say front end project something to java or javascript right yeah. so that is very important and i can say for sure i mean there have been uh, many more million cases of a nine pointer messing it all up rather than a six pointer doing it so a six pointer might give you a better option a quicker and an easier and a shortcut and a 9 pointer might stick to the basic um, bookish knowledge and uh, might end up you know messing it all up so it's all about how smart you are it's not about uh, your grade points i mean you can only uh, you know it's a test of memory to be honest these points and all these stuff this is what i believe so the application comes down to your work and your dedication at the end of the day 9.8 point okay. doesn't matter yeah yeah so i will like go the same feeling because i am also somebody who look out for data science interns i've actually recruited couple of interns in the first uh, when i first joined and petel and i have always seen that it's not the gp and traditionally i have never been about gpa uh, or any of the scores for that matter but what we look at is if you establish like what rahul said if there is a portfolio that you can showcase uh, show some credentials where you have so something at npetel that we look at is if you have contributed to a uh, open source project or a community project that really matters a lot because uh, in an um, organization like npetel that attitude of helping out the service uh, part of the thing is a really big uh, big plus for us because we know that then you are driven by your own you are self driven that really matters when it comes to short internships and other things so uh with so so, uh, so just to add to that i mean you know so in ibm there is one initiative which is called call for code so it's like you know a kind of a uh, so you build your own use case and you are given certain uh, time frame and there is a prize money for it so it's basically a services program so you build something which is good for the community so it can be something exactly. say for example which uh, you know um, attacks the uh, the the problem of climate change so probably you build a solution and then show a working demo in the form of a minimum viable product so i would probably you know ask you that okay the 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 call for code competition i think is going to open or probably it's open so anybody can participate so probably you know search for call for code ibm online and you know try to see that if you can participate so at least if you participate as as uh, you know jakeshna was rightly talking about it definitely shows your interest in you know how you want to you know portray your interest for the community as a greater good and that will be seen in a very positive life when you go for internship so that is one avenue probably yeah thanks shantanu uh so uh, mahesh i am going to lower your hand uh, let i hope your question has been answered the next person is uh, shruti cs shruti if you are there i have sent you a request to unmute yeah please yes, go ahead yes sir 
Thank you. Uh, so I have like two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do you decide if uh, this particular problem can actually be solved using ML? And uh, what advantage does it have over uh, normal statistics? And uh, the second one is, uh, I have an offline degree in health sciences. Uh, where might I be able to, uh, you know, provide value uh, given the background diversity? Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I'll and just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Devas Smriti. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I know it was probably a question related to the slide I put together. Uh, so the reason uh, we do that is uh, statistics is a very old discipline. In fact, personally, I mean, I'm also a student of statistics. So people do understand that. Uh, and many folks in the business, they also understand what a regression is, what a time series model is, right? So when you are uh, building a solution, uh, like a very traditional technique, uh, people understand it and it's very easy to implement in any most of the platforms, right? When you're talking about machine learning models, you have to bring in cloud, you have to build data pipeline, and honestly, not of not a lot of skill sets are available in most of the businesses. You know, not not everybody is lucky like IBM or SAP, right? To to have these uh, data scientists, right? So, uh, <laughs> right? So so they have mostly the analytics team of uh, most of the companies are very handful, and and as you know, data science skills are very very rare because uh, not a lot of people do STEM degrees, right? So to answer your question, Shruti, um, when we build a solution like ML, it's important to show them why they should invest and why they should complicate matters, right? Because we are still in the initial phase of uh, many businesses still are not sold on ML. So you have to create a use case why they should invest and is the extra investment uh, you know, going to face them the benefit? It's almost like a return on investment, right? So, so that is why we do that, but it's not necessarily true if you are talking to a very progressive organization where they are sold that ML is the thing to go, then you don't have to create that use case, right? You can straight away go on an ML path, right? So when you're doing consulting work, you have to find out what is a journey or analytical maturity of an organization. And then you have to you know, have those conversations. Uh, hopefully I answer your question, uh, Shruti. Yeah, uh, thanks Devasmith. Shantanu, you want to add on uh, something? Because uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you are now IBM and SAP, so you, I mean, people will ask you more questions about more uh, uh, related to these kind of aspects of uh, which are uh, higher organizations and. Yeah, so I mean, okay, traditional statistics, obviously, I mean, as as uh, there was Mr. already just you know spoke about a little bit. So definitely, I mean, there is a wide application. So for example, if you go for any drug approval, right? So for example, if you talk about US FDA, say for example, or even in India. So that's where, you know, something like, you know, as, as simple as hypothesis testing, if you remember. So they are find a wide, wide range of statistics. But if you uh, move on to the, you know, the industry problems that we are getting nowadays, right? So for example, you know, as simple as uh, a time series forecasting and demand, you know, stock, inventory, then you know recommendations uh, based on uh, you know buying patterns, selling patterns. So, so then cognitive pricing of you know different uh, you know bids which which comes. Uh, I mean, so what should be the right price that you have? So those sort of scenarios are very new and probably you know they have never been thought of earlier, and that is also probably you know due to the advancement of uh, um, that the the discipline I would say because you have a lot complicated algorithms. The computation power has increased manifold. So, for example, the same algorithm which used to take hours or maybe days to run, you can run now probably you know with with super speed processors, you know probably on the fly. So, for example, IBM has partnerships with uh, Intel. IBM has partnerships with Nvidia. So, who work on constantly, you know, how can we improve it? And then kind of we provide this as a hardware come software platform. So, I mean our algorithms that IBM is going to provide via their our own tools. So they are going to be in tune with whatever hardware platform you are running on. So with so much of advancement going on in, and also with and with a plethora of use cases that are coming on, obviously, I mean, machine learning and the advanced concepts are going to be uh, the 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 call for in the future. So for example, I'll briefly talk about a very small use case. So we're talking, we were working with one of this uh, uh, diamond merchants based out of Singapore, and they had a very uh, unique problem. Said so that okay, daily we get you know this many different types of diamonds, and we have you know so many different types of necklaces, bangles, earrings, 
and it takes a lot of manual effort for us to kind of segregate and you know label them so can you build us something so that so for example there are around you know 1000 uh, line items that are coming in today whether you can you know categorize them and put it say for example this is a necklace with this type of diamond so for example you have a sapphire you have some crystal cut and lot of other diamond names which i don't remember now but then said the can you do this automatically probably just by looking at the picture so then we did a sort of an uh, a machine learning algorithm okay using neural networks and obviously uh, we faced a lot of challenges because the images were not of right quality so we had to use masking and all sort of things in order to ensure that you know there was appropriate uh, tagging so it reduced manual effort a lot okay and it also helped them tag uh, by looking at the images okay this is going to this particular category so you know depending on how many categories you have defined so such is the beauty of you know uh, the use cases that you find nowadays so which probably a traditional uh, statistics won't be able to solve and you have to take the help of something quite advanced okay and and as i said the computational power of systems nowadays have increased manifold so so that's where uh, you can uh, you know use and and secondly coming to the second question if you have a healthcare background obviously i mean that is one domain probably uh, the application of statistics in in um, uh, in in uh, this field has been huge for example ibm watson had worked with healthcare and the medical uh, domain initially so when the product was launched so there was a lot of interaction with the doctors because they said that you know whenever so how can we you know probably just by looking at uh, uh, the symptoms of a person how what sort of diagnostics or what site of prescriptive statistics that we can you know kind of recommend just by uh, talking to them just by you know converting their you know speech to something which is understandable so so yes obviously there are a lot of use cases um, from your domain and uh, definitely i mean you can utilize uh, your uh, degree in that perspective Yeah. Thanks, Shantanu. Rahul, uh, I know both of them have uh, talked a lot. Uh, can you put in some points uh, related to the first question, which is, uh, I mean, oh, sorry, the second part of it, health sciences and uh, uh, data science. From a talent acquisition perspective, how do you see uh, uh, somebody with a health science background featuring in a data science job? I mean, uh, when it comes to this uh, degree course that we have, I mean, uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is being taught in such a way such that a person can, um, you know, join in from the absolute basic level. So that is going to educate a lot of people coming in from diverse backgrounds. Now, when it comes to the application of data science into the healthcare field and the other fields, I mean, it has uh, not. picked up the pace extensively but i have seen a lot of uh, openings a lot of projects new projects coming up over the past one one and a half year even before the start of covid as well a lot of uh, projects into data science and you know uh, healthcare uh, is into data science that has grown a lot which i have probably not seen in the earlier part of my career about 3 uh, 3 and 3 three, three and a half years ago so this is kicking in it is set to uh, grow stronger over the next 2 to 2 and a half years and uh, i mean the application of data science is really diverse i mean there's no place wherein you can you know put a stamp or put a mark and say i mean no data, you can't use data science here. so the applications is so huge that is going to end up in every corners of your life that is for sure yeah so uh, just to add my thoughts to this uh, so uh, i've been working in npital for the past 3 years and uh, if you look at uh, how do we use uh, data science or those kind of things uh, in in terms of ml models and other things no you don't use it so we have a, a, a our own artificial intelligence you have met our artificial intelligence uh, bharti madam she has a truck load of excel sheets and lot of data you ask her even now she will tell you what was the percentage uh, people who passed in a particular course in a particular year i mean such is the i mean that is our so that is the access random access that we have uh, i've been uh, dealing with data science uh, team uh, we have been building up a small data science team initially uh, but generally in projects like ours which is uh, more of operation driven uh we actually need to invest a lot of time in getting the right set of people getting them adjusted to the uh, uh operational setting and uh, make them realize how important it is uh, the relevance of data so i'll give you a simple example the kind of messages that come to you 
say in WhatsApp, uh, with the alerts and other things. You can actually have ML models to uh, send it, uh, label each of you as in based on your uh, the number of engagement that you see in the portal uh, to like what Devas uh initially showed. Uh, we could uh, somebody who is really active. Uh, and like what Shantanu was saying, okay, he looks only at uh, these kind of uh, activities, activity question, graded assignment, and all those things. So he's he's very really, uh, focused user. Uh, so, uh, and like what Rahul, he looks into questions uh, much ahead of deadline. So we can categorize users even even by looking at how they are uh, interacting with our platform, how they are interacting with data. Uh, I'm not saying that we are actually doing it, but in general, that is how we can actually use it and uh, do a lot more things. So, uh, if you want, I mean, you so could do it, and you could advise people who might be on the wrong absolutely. path, probably. Absolutely. So, we are actually having some ideas on that line. Uh, currently, the volumes are not as high as what we would want because this is only the first batch, and we actually have need a lot more data to predict it with lot more accuracy and. Uh, the amount of data cleaning, I know both Shantanu and Devasmith would agree to me. It will be a nightmare for anyone who is going to come in and uh, look at the data, the kind of JSON data that we have uh, to sort, sift through it. And there will be a lot more. Uh, see, it is very unpredictable when it comes to learning. I mean, I did my PhD in learning design and specifically in massive open online courses. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, many a times, uh, this idea of learning is so, uh, it's still not clear. And my uh, supervisor used to say, in India, there are two things everybody has comment on. One is on cricket, what shot to play, when to play, what ball to ball. <laughs> and the other one is education. So everybody has an idea and it is really hard uh, for uh, uh, us to, I mean, any machine to uh, match with a, a prediction that uh, uh, anyone is giving. So, uh, so in general, uh, how do you, so something like a rough th uh, thumb rule that we do is, how quickly can this particular thing give you a approximate idea of what is needed to solve the problem? Okay. So if it is a machine learning model that can give you answer within, let's say one day of processing, good. Or let's say, I ask Bharti in one minute, she responds. <laughs> I'll go for <laughs> Bharti's answer rather than a machine, which is going to give me one full day for the entire process to happen. So it's pretty much practical when it comes to bigger projects and uh, things like that. But uh, the industries who are investing a lot, if they have a larger vision and other things, they would really want uh, the data-backed uh, decision-making to happen. And uh, they will invest in that. So do not worry. So all those people who are... Uh, I, I, so while you are all seeing it, I hope you are also getting those comments. I'm getting private chats with questions. Uh, so I hope this would have addressed most of those questions. It doesn't matter what degree you are in, whether you are weak in one subject or not. As the time progresses, you will gain experience. You will understand all those things. Uh, the basic fundamental thing to know is always connect with people, understand how data is used. Look for data around you. Okay. Each of us is producing tons of data. See how you can use it. That's that's what I said. Look for open source projects. Look for open competitions. That would give you a real insight into data processing. And you don't have to work on production scale uh, right now. You are a student. I, I, uh, so nobody would expect you to work in uh, Apache, uh, I mean, Hadoop, Spark, and all those things. All those comes in, in this, this side of the uh equation so do not worry about it uh, your lhs may be not equal to rhs at this moment but don't worry over time we'll add more models we'll add more complex statistical probabilities permutations combinations etc and we'll make lhs equal to rhs it's a work in progress okay so don't worry about it okay so uh it's almost eight o'clock uh I have a hard stop at 8.10 because uh, IIT Madras gates close at 8.30 and it takes me 20 minutes to travel to IIT Madras gate. <laughs> so I'll take uh, questions uh, till the next two points. I hope it is okay with both of you. Uh, we, we started at eight, uh, 6 o'clock and we promised 7.30. It has gone to 8. So I'll have uh, Nikhil Singh to ask the question. Nikhil, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to all of you. 
Um, am I audible? Yeah, Nikhil, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I saw sir, in the in, uh, first slide of some of you that you have done masters and uh, I'm currently in first year of my VTech and uh, I'm quite skeptical regarding uh, this masters thing that uh, upon my basically uh, research on internet, I found that uh, most of the people have said that the masters is for the research uh, people for research uh, people and uh, it's not for the one who are seeking job in uh, this computer engineering field is it so okay uh, uh, thanks nikhil for that question uh, uh, i'll first ask rahul to take a crack because you are the talent acquisition guy i mean uh, yeah if you uh, want uh, to go into academics and you want to pursue a career into academics Teacher, professor. Rahul, uh, can you keep your uh, mic oh, closed? Sorry, yeah. So, like I was saying, if you want to uh, build a career uh, in the academics section and want to be a teacher or professor in college or something like that, you have to go through the bachelor's and then master's and a PhD as well. But that is not the only place wherein you would have to choose, uh, you would have to, you know, get additional uh, master's degrees or further degrees and advancements as well. But there are a few jobs like the one that I shared on my slide they were expecting a person to have phd and around 10 years of experience into nlp so nowadays it's not just about like you know you can have a bachelor's degree and crack on with any single job for the rest of your lives you have to you know uh, get yourself a masters because it's all about how better you are than the others if you have a master's degree you may have a better knowledge about specific domains that might actually be uh, coming in handy uh, when you're in a project or something of that sort. So it's not just about uh, pursuing your career into academics. It's about getting yourselves, uh, you know, um, it's about being in the top uh, half or a specific top 10, top 20, top 30 percentile of those. All. So that's what it's all about. It's not just about, uh, you know, getting into academics and becoming a professor but if you get a PhD. It's about you have to get even in the IT sector, even in specific jobs, you have to get yourself, uh, you know, more educated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Devasmith, you have any thoughts on PG? No, not really. I think uh, I can tell you the quality of the BSc program that I'm personally going through. I have actually finished a master's, so I see the it's all about the quality of the program. Uh, these degrees are all kind of I would call it. Uh, a qualifier, right? You know, to define what you'd have learned, right? So I would guarantee that if you finish this three year program, uh, there'll be dot of Java available waiting for you. I don't think, you know, uh, it's all about the quality and how much in depth of knowledge you have, right? And of course, you can always do the masters if need be, but I don't think that's really a necessary condition to, to get uh, into data science uh, jobs. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, David Smith. Uh, Shantanu, any uh, point to add on? Yeah, I think just to echo there was mixed word as he rightly said, I mean, I mean, this degree course is more than enough because I have actually done a lot of research and a lot of other certificate and diploma courses that a lot of institutes along with some, you know, online education medium do take out. I mean, this is more than comprehensive, especially with the electives going on. So they give you a lot of specialization when you progress into the third year and you have your, you know, a wide range of topics to choose from. And, and if you want to focus on AI and ML, there are a huge number of subjects and, and the number of electives that you can choose, uh, which Andrew sir actually, you know, uh, showed us on the other day. I mean, just do that. I mean, more than enough. And I mean, if you want to do your master's, you're always welcome, but that is never going to be a prerequisite for the knowledge that you would have already gained. Okay. So uh, 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 to answer Nikhil, uh, one, okay because somebody I have done gone through masters and I've uh, done my PhD and it's a long job I mean long time duration in that uh, so master skills uh, I think where it would be relevant so nowadays if you look at industry it is actually whether you have the uh, very specific or relevant skill set uh, first they look at attitude then they look at very specific skill set that you have so in bachelor's, you mean uh, the current bachelor's curriculum across uh, several institutions may not cover some of the areas that the industry would want to uh, venture into or, or, or they are currently working in. So uh, in these kind of places, a master's degree uh, would, would be an added advantage, but it will not assure you a job. Okay. 
uh, at the end job is ultimately dependent on your skill set and your attitude so uh, if you are going to pursue masters take a wise and a very conscious decision why you want that particular masters degree like how each of them have selected a bsc uh, selected this particular program because of its structure its uh, the place where it has come from uh, and even uh, see it's a added responsibility on the institution also to ensure that uh, the people coming out of this program are uh, are at a skill level which is at par with any other iit graduate see we are giving an iit degree an iit degree means something right so uh, it's our constant endeavor to ensure that the benchmark remains same regardless of whether you are learning online or you are learning from your own home it doesn't matter uh, that skill set and attitude we need uh, it it is it is the first thing that an employer would look at uh uh so i hope i have added uh, so i saw your add on questions i hope i have addressed that part also uh, i'll have one last question otherwise they will lock me in iit uh, so uh, the last question will be from a and r uh, bharat a uh, i'm going to request you to unmute yeah, A&R Bharat, uh, can you first yeah. tell me, tell us your name? Yeah, Bharat Kumar, sir. Bharat Kumar, okay, Bharat Kumar, please post your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you for giving the opportunity, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, currently I'm doing the automation and robotics, master's hmm. in Usman University. Okay. So, th how can it will be helpful, the BSc degree and our robotics branch? <laughs> I can see the pensive faces of all three speakers. Uh, so let me uh, take a crack at this question. Maybe after that, I'll give you uh, one more person can answer. And if you are happy with my answer, then you can say thumbs up and I'll move to one last question. Okay, Bharat, uh, so like uh, what we were discussing, any kind of master's or specialization, uh, look at the additional knowledge that you can, which will uh, make you stand upon. Okay, uh, automation, uh, all those industries actually require a lot of, uh, see, look at how the trend is uh, in the automation arena. IoT has come. Okay, uh, you have uh, each industry, so uh, uh, even uh, the transportation industry or even your regular industry, they are looking at uh, uh, carrying over, uh, so minimizing their operational uh, things and also looking at climate change. Uh, there are a lot of these confounds uh, everywhere. So see whether some of the skill set that you gain as part of this program will be suitable for any of addressing any of these challenges. And always, uh, my advice is try solving smaller problems locally. Okay, that that exercise in itself will give you enough ideas about how do you what happens uh, in complex systems. And each of the problem that you will uh, come across will be in real life. Uh, there will be a lot of interaction between uh, different different systems. Uh, so a little bit. Uh, Working with these kind of systems will give you something what we call. So, if you look at computational thinking, it is a core skill set, right? So, like that, you can also develop systemic thinking. So, it's called systems thinking per se. Uh, so, those kind of skill sets can be gained by you by working on small local problems, and you will get a sense of how to transfer this to a new scenario. That is what. Uh, every industry or every uh, employer would look at i mean how can somebody solve my problem that's uh, given this kind of uh, confounds uh, is it okay yeah, sir, uh, that, uh, sir i have one more question yeah yeah actually recently i started the little uh, such help help to the people for such the new tenants to get the mm -hmm. house rent house mm -hmm. in this whatever i Actually, I went to the some our locality area only. I searched, I asked about the ranges of how mm. why you're not getting the new tenants and how much your uh, price code for the rent. And let us research about the I wanted to start a little company about uh, to platform for the tenants and uh, homeowners to mm -hmm. easy to get the home. 
okay so i don't have the uh, basic like technology like i don't know the basically i'm from the mechanical energy so i don't have the, any application knowledge how to make the this to yeah, get so, the application uh, so how so, is bsd yeah so, so i want to the, this bsc technology as a brick to the, my foundation like okay to pursue yeah. the entrepreneurship yeah so this is what devas smith addressed in his slide so if you are looking at building programming skills and other things there are a lot of these programming courses as part of this particular degree program and i our advice to you would be to look at all those opportunities and also connect with your uh, other peers a lot of a lot of smaller communities are there be part of those kind of communities and that is the only way in which you can come up i, I mean again uh, just doing bsc degree is not sufficient it is not a i mean what do you say a single pill to solve all the problems it is only it is only showing you way i mean you have this big community that is there each of them are so these kind of sessions give you insight into how you could approach uh, a career or what all are the different kind of problems and all those things so engage in conversation be part of community i think that is the only way in which i mean that is the only easiest answer that i can give you uh, there are no shortcuts unfortunately uh, to program you have to you have to actually code and learn there is absolutely no other go uh, i learned python after coming to edpeter so i did my phd and all those things still i didn't know python i learned it uh, from my interns so and yeah that attitude is important i mean learning can happen at any point of time so just keep yourself open to that and these kind of mindsets actually help you like what you are doing right now is what uh, in industry parlance or in, in in traditional academic thing we call it as design thinking you empathize with customers you go through a customer life cycle so there are a lot of jargons associated with it but ultimately you are helping someone to solve their problem okay so continue doing that and you will soon able to connect to all these things uh, by the end of third year and we wish you the best uh, i hope uh, you will connect you, to a lot of your friends uh, in the meantime uh okay Thank guys uh, really sorry uh, because uh, i am being intimated that uh, they are going to close the gates pretty soon it takes me 10 minutes to walk over to the gate uh, i really understand that uh, all of you are very keen so the next person who is on the line would be just uh, asking me so one request to all the speakers uh, whenever you get time uh, what we are thinking is uh, if we put up some forum or some informal space so we have a website right now uh, we will soon so as part of this entire gsu product there is something called google currents i understand that uh, all of you are not really active in social media but in the next week if we open up google currents for you where uh, the questions will be from uh, online degree students only uh please do take some time off to answer some of the generic questions uh it would be really helpful and for all the people who are there we will be having more such sessions from your peers and of course to all of you we will come back to you for internship and other kind of request next year not this one i hope you have a fantastic term too uh and uh, yeah if you are doing odd four courses we will be on the lookout for your names and roll numbers and we'll be constantly watching what you are doing <laughs> so thanks uh, devasmith rahul and shantanu it was a fantastic session really uh, i mean really opened up uh, a lot more questions and lot more uh, i mean in fact it is now loading us we have to now ensure that we deliver everything that you are you have hinted to uh, so we hope that we continue delivering the best uh, program uh, in the upcoming semesters as well a uh, couple of things uh, that we would hope is as you move into the higher terms you may be part of good study groups where you can actually mentor some of your peers towards these kind of um, areas uh, so by mentoring what i meant is just sensitize them to these kind of areas like what uh, shantanu just told today there is a particular initiative within ibm uh, where uh, they can code uh, they can submit uh, things so these kind of areas if you are aware do let us know in fact we will also uh, uh, what do you say uh, send it out to the entire audience of the program that would be really great if you can help us out in these kind of uh, uh, sensitization activity
Indeed. And uh, there are a lot of requests for connecting with you in LinkedIn. I hope uh, you will take a, a suitable call uh, based on the requests. Uh, you have now you are now officially famous. Uh, you are the first set of professionals as part of the IIT Madras BSc degree program uh, to address your colleagues from the other side. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the entire 100 plus uh, people, 150 people were there. Thanks everyone and thanks a lot to the studio team and my support team who are still waiting for getting out so that they can also reach the gate <laughs> fast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, yeah. sir. Yeah, no, thank sure. you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank uh, you. Sure. It was really a pleasure uh, to address the entire student community and me also being on the same side. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, will always be there to support you whenever needed. Yeah. And the curious note is uh, all three of you are from the eastern part of India, uh, the east, south, uh, the eastern uh, section of India. Uh, we'll try to find the north, east, and south the next time round. So, professionals who are from these part of the places, uh, please do uh, ping us. We'll, we would want a lot of these sessions to happen before the next term. Uh, hopefully, we will open up uh, Thursdays and Wednesdays for these kind of student sessions. Uh, we want more people to connect and we want more people to know each other really well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.